afternoon, everybody. Welcome to my broadcast. My name is Diana Hooper, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the ULB over in Belgium. Um, I'm a theoretical physicist. That means that I study a lot of stuff. Specifically, I focus on cosmology. So I study the universe, the contents of the universe, basically everything inside. And I'm really happy today to be joined by a guest on my broadcast. So over to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sanya. I'm a PhD student at Diana's alma mater. So I'm a PhD student at RWDH Aachen. I also study dark matter, but I kind of sit at the interface between particle physics and cosmology. So what I try to do is to figure out, because they're just like innumerable dark matter models that you can construct out of the stand model. So what I try to do is kind of find a balance between what kind of model could work and what that tells us about like a general theory of dark matter. Um, yeah, so that's a very quick 30 second introduction of what I study. Yeah, very quick overview there. So our plan today is to talk about all things science related. So we're both going to answer any questions you might have or you folks have about science in general, any questions you have about what it's like to be a woman in science, because today is International Women and Girls in Science Day. And we're also going to have a bit of a discussion about some biases and problems and issues that women still face in science today, even though we would like to think that these are issues of the past. Unfortunately, they're not. So we're going to start with a bit of discussion, but at any point, if you want to jump in, you know, just ask us questions, comments, whatever you want. We get comments from both Periscope, perhaps, and Twitter here. So whichever platform you're working on, just feel free to shoot us your questions or comments, and we'll be happy to incorporate them in the discussion. So we're going to start with a bit of a discussion from Sania about five biases that women fa still face in science. Yes, OK, so it might be more than five. Uh... Right. Approximately um, five. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, so of course, this would not be an exhaustive list, but it would kind of be just to give everyone a general idea of what the situation in science is right now. Um, before I start, I, I would like to say that when we talk about women in science, it's very important that we remember that we're talking about all women in science. So that includes black women, women of color, trans women, women with disabilities. And it's important to remember this because when your identity kind of lies at the intersection of uh, different things, for example, gender and race, you do end up facing significant challenges which you would not otherwise face. And so whenever we talk about, for example, things to improve equality or uh, to kind of make our academic spaces more inclusive for all of these people, we need to make sure that we understand that it's not only sexism that enters in the conversation, but also things like racism or ableism, et cetera. Um, right, so to with that kind of small caveat, uh, I, I would kind of talk about um, different aspects of. Uh, okay, so so all of the all of the challenges or hurdles that women face, you can kind of put them on a spectrum. So on one side, you would have some something like microaggressions, where it would be you know day to day things that happen in the workplace that are not really well that bad, but when you pile them everything up, they they kind of point to a larger systemic problem. So, um, but then that on the other end, there's kind of like very serious um, challenges that people face, which can actually lead to harm, like physical harm uh, for the person in science. And so on that end of the spectrum, you would have like things like sexual harassment, uh, racial discrimination, et cetera, which are kind of all of these big things. Um, we would expect that, you know, it's the 21st century, we're kind of in science, right? So you people have this idea about science being open to everyone and very kind of, um, you know, not biased, but we do, we still end up seeing kind of these things happen to our colleagues in academia. And so, so those are kind of the big issues. So kind of sexual harassment issues, uh, racial discrimination issues, then kind of along the same lines, you have um, discrimination in kind of hiring people, uh, getting grants, um, in kind of peer review processes that we have uh, for our academic papers, for instance. And this is kind of also another big like systemic issue that, that is present. So uh, what this ends up doing is we have fewer and fewer women as we advance to upper levels of academia. So we have, um, maybe we have a lot of undergraduate women, but then we don't have as much, as many master students, and then we don't have as many PhD students, et cetera, et cetera. So it keeps on like dropping as we go. And so all of these kind of are like major systemic issues. But then there are kind of, like I said, day-to-day -day things that uh, you suffer from uh, when you are a woman working in an academic space. So the and Diana, just feel free to jump in whenever. 
So sure, sure. Um, no, go go ahead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So so one of the things is that um, nobody really kind of uh, everyone always questions your expertise, or it's very common for people to question your expertise. And so uh, if, if you're, for example, in a room with a male colleague and someone comes in to ask a question, they would point that question almost always to the male colleague and not to you. And so this is one of the things that happens. So you have to prove that you have a right to be in the place that you are at. And then this also takes the form of things like, uh, you know, getting comments that you are just a diversity hire or you just got the position because you're a woman Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So, so at every step of the way, you have to prove um, that you actually belong there, and then you that you deserve that space. So you kind of have to be extra good in what you do, in some sense. So you so you have to be above average to actually get your foot in the door in the first place. And then there is stuff like um, you have to so 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 all of these um, things that I'm talking about, I've I've picked them up from from the internet, also from like personal experiences, from specific articles. So all of these things are well documented, and uh, yeah, maybe uh, we could put a link or so in in the chat. Um, yeah, well, once the broadcast is over, I'll post a few links that we used to prepare for today, so that you'll have everyone will have access to the links at the end of the broadcast. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good idea. So, so the other thing that uh, that happen, ends up happening is because you are entering a male dominated space, you're expected to change uh, certain attributes that are commonly associated with your gender. So, for example, women are expected to be more masculine, uh, just to get people to take them seriously. So, for example, if if you uh, if you dress more feminine, then people would just kind of, you know, brush you off very easily. They won't they won't consider what you're saying. So, you have to change some aspects of yourself to fit in. But then it's always a tightrope because if you go to the extreme end, if you're too aggressive, if you're too authoritative, then people just don't want to associate with you anymore. And so that leads to like loss of collaborators and stuff. Um, yeah, I think that's a, a very interesting comment. I want to give a specific example here of what we mean by like being more masculine or specific features. And one case comes to mind that actually happened to some colleagues of ours, where a female colleague used to like baking and bringing stuff to the office. And she was told by her male peers that perhaps she didn't want to do that because it was propagating the stereotype of women, women baking. And to be taken more seriously in the office, she should not bring any baked goods to the office. And it seems like a very, very minor thing, but it's a thing on top of many other things. Anyway, yeah. Please carry on. Yeah, it's ex it's exactly like you said, right? So if you if you look at all of these things individually, they don't seem like that big of a deal, right? Like your colleague made a, a comment, like a small comment. It's not that big of a deal. But then on, if you pile everything on top, then it kind of gets exhausting to first keep having the same conversation and again, again, and then second to actually try to you know try to educate people uh, because this is what ends up happening is that uh, the kind of the burden of all of these issues falls on women to explain so uh, uh, and Deanna knows this as well like we've had many of these conversations uh, with our friends and with our colleagues and uh, with other people uh, and it's, it usually ends up with the person who is from a minority background to sort of explain to the other people why there is a problem and like there is a problem in the first place which is just too much extra work that we put on uh, put on women yeah, and it's usually prompted by one of these microaggressions your colleagues might say something and you say okay i'm going to call it out because you know you shouldn't say these type of things and oftentimes i'll get defensive like oh you know it's just a jokey comment like yes i know you just meant a jokey comment but it's the 15th time i've heard this comment and it's not a joke to me and then we're always seen in this regard as the troublemakers because we're starting the issue of calling out these behaviors, making other people aware of them. And apart from the emotional and you know time in the emotional burden, the time investment, it also does come across like we're starting fights or being less of a team player when we call out our colleagues on such behaviors. Yeah. So um, yeah. So that was uh, most of the things on my list. And I guess, again, to like kind of bring it back, uh, it's again important to mention that uh, all of these things are worse for black women and women of color and uh, sort of all uh, sort of women who who have other identities on top of just being a woman. And so, uh, for example, it's very common for black women or women of color to be mistaken for administrative staff or custodial staff. Uh, so it's, um, it's very important to keep that in mind, uh, I guess, that all of these issues even though today is like International Women's 
and science day, uh, we, we also need to keep in mind like a lot of minorities in academia face issues that are kind of similar. And, and so, yeah, so we should think about all of them when we talk about, uh, you know, diversity. Yeah, that is absolutely a very good point because obviously women are underrepresented in science, but white women are more represented than other minorities. And often diversity or inclusion efforts will say, okay, we've hired a white woman, that's it, we're done. And this is very much far from the truth because as Sunny was just saying, people at the intersection of several of these identities are much more discriminated against than white women in science. So it's something that we should be very much aware of when having this conversation. So I, I actually want to now briefly, I think you were done there, Sunia? Yeah, yeah. So I want to um, briefly discuss a study that I think is very interesting, which is looking at how different people within science and within STEM fields in general, how these people perceive such an inequality. Are people aware of this? What do they attribute this to? So there was a very interesting study done quite recently. I would just like to um, bring up a, not really a slide, an image here. And I'm just going to kill both of our cameras momentarily, just so you can focus on the image of it. So let me do it properly and put this in hero mode. So I want to discuss a study that was actually very recent. It was just last year of asking this question of how do different people see the problem of inequality in STEM? And this study focused on undergrad students in the US. Um, I think it's very interesting that they focus on undergrad students because this is the level where a lot of inclusion and diversity efforts go. You want to keep women who are doing their undergrad in, you want to convince more women to take up different science majors. So this, you would think, is an area where these topics are discussed more frequently. So it's very interesting to see how this is actually playing out on how different people understand inequalities in science. So the authors of this publication of this study wanted to assess two questions. The first question was how do different participants reason about the ethnic and gender inequity in STEM? And is there a difference across different genders and ethnicities as to how people answer this question? So in order to, to assess this, all participating students were given the, the question prompt of white men are overrepresented in STEM fields. This means that women and people of color are underrepresented. What do you think about this? So it was an open-ended question with the idea that people were free to interpret this question, provide any answer they want, and give their answer any spin they want. And then the idea here was to see what different types of answer people provided and actually how these answers were connected. So making that one disappear here. So what the authors did, I will link to the study at the end, so you will have access to the study to see all the details. It's a 25-page study. It's pretty quick to read, and it's very interesting, I found. So I'm just going to bring up another image here and put it in hero mode. So they, once the scientists had these 350 answers or 340 answers, they classified them in broad categories based on what topics were discussed in the answer. So first of all, they, discuss, they split their results into people who think that inequality is a problem in STEM and people who don't think it's a problem. So interestingly, 75% of the people who answered agree that inequity is a problem in STEM, whereas 25% of the people who answered do not think this is a problem. So then within the people who agree that this is a problem, they look for different topics or keywords that were discussed and split it into four groups, discussions of fairness. For an example, people writing comments like everybody should be welcome regardless of background, that was included under fairness. Systematic bias, which was very much tying in with what Sunny already discussed, or comments like there are more, more opportunities for white men than there are for other people in science. Stereotyping, which is also this idea of the negative stereotypes that people have to overcome in STEM fields. For an example, the, the things Sunny just mentioned, of people, black women or women of color being mistaken for the assistant staff or for the help is a stereotype that people have. And this is something that a lot of people answering these studies highlighted as one of the issues. And then there was also the idea of confidence. And I found this one very interesting because this is the idea that women throughout their lives have been told, for an example, women are not good at science, women are good, not good at mathematics, to the point that women start doubting themselves and have this confidence issue, which makes them more reluctant to go into STEM fields. So, of course, the percentages here won't necessarily add up to 100 because there were answers that covered multiple of these cases. So an answer that covered multiple of these cases was counted in both. 
Then on the other hand, they had people who do not think that inequality is a problem. And there were four main justifications as to why they didn't think inequality was a problem instead. The first one is the one that we hear very often is that maybe minorities are just not interested in science. There's no systematic bias, there's nothing like that. It's just a lack of interest. And 11% of the people who answered this questionnaire or this question actually highlighted lack of interest as the main reason for inequality. Then there's also the idea of merit base, which is saying STEM, academia, and science is a meritocracy. People who are there are there because they deserve to be, and people who are not there is because they're not well qualified enough. Therefore, it is not an inequality problem. Another type of response here in the, in the category of inequality is not a problem was the idea that STEM is diverse. And this was people making comments like, but I see women in my classes, therefore STEM is perfectly diverse. I do not see a problem here. This accounts for 5% of the answers. So 5% of the answers included comment like STEM is already diverse enough. And very interestingly, there were 2% of the answers that were along the lines of this is not a problem to STEM. And this included comments like, in nursing, there are more women than men, and yet we don't talk about that. So why should we talk about there being more men in science? So I thought that was a very interesting. And broadly, it goes to show that there are still a lot of people who don't think, I've just got something stuck on here, Omo, so let me just try to fix that a sec. So there are broadly a lot of people who still think that inequality is not a problem. It's only 25%, but that is a substantial amount. And when you add in the reasons of this whole meritocracy, or especially the lack of interest, these are reasons that we hear very often when we have this conversation. As Sania said before, we're often in the situation where we have to bring up this topic, where we have to discuss this. And the arguments we often hear is it's a perfect meritocracy, maybe people just aren't interested. So addressing these issues, I think, is very important. And I think this study highlights a gap in, in communication here because it's something that is tried to highlight a lot. And yet there was still a large percent of people who use these arguments that have been refuted time and time again. So this was one part of the study. The other very interesting part was seeing how this plays out across different genders and ethnicities. And I think that was also very, very interesting. And I'm just going to bring up the final thing here. And let's see if I can do it properly this time. So just the final conclusions from the study was that 75% of undergrads find that inequality is a problem in STEM. However, women were much more likely than men to mention stereotyping and lack of confidence. They do a statistical analysis and find that it is significantly more likely that women mention stereotyping and lack of confidence. On the other hand, men are statistically much more likely to reference lack of interest than women when answering this questionnaire. And then they did a study across different ethnicities to see how, how this is addressed. Uh, I found it a bit unfortunate that they only, they, they ask people on their ethnicities, they provide eight or nine categories, and then they only focus on white, Latino, and Native American. It was a very US-based study. However, I felt like the exclusion in this study, particularly of black women, was very noticeable. But what they found here is that Latino participants, both male and female, were much more likely to discuss stereotyping as an issue they face and one of the main causes of inequality in STEM. The authors do mention that their study has several misgivings, one of which is that they completely do a binary separation of gender, they ignore certain ethnicities, and they didn't look for people at the cross-section of several of these factors. So first they looked independently at gender and then at ethnicity. So the study does have some issues, but I think it's very striking, although not surprising, maybe, to see just how many, how many men still think that it's just a lack of interest, whereas women are much more likely to highlight the real underlying causes that have been studied here. Yeah, I also... Uh, no, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, just something that you mentioned is one of the options, that reasons that people give is um, that so there are more women in nursing and so it's not really why don't we talk about that but i think um it's, it's it's interesting right because nursing is seen as a feminine profession because it's a caregiving profession and so that that is the fact that we have more women in nursing than men is can also be constructed as a problem because we are kind of uh you know it's, it's just uh, we assume that women would make better nurses because they make better caregivers in some sense and I guess there was also this flip with uh, computer science, uh, uh, 
when it was just coming up, uh, tended to have more women, but then it became into like a male profession. And then now it has pushed out all of the women that were in there in the first place. So yeah, it, it's, it's kind of interesting when people bring that up as a reason to, to it's, it's kind of a what about argument, right? So, so what about nursing? Why are we not talking about that? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's deflecting from the conversation at hand. And as you just said, it, it is very much tied to the roles that we've placed on different genders in society. And if you, you ask people what characteristics do they ascribe to a scientist, a lot of people will say that they're very successful, they're, very, they're driven, they're intelligent. And then you ask which gender has these characteristics, and most people will point to men because of the unconscious bias we have because of our upbringing, because of the way society views gender roles. So gender roles are intrinsically connected to the gender stereotypes here, and this plays a role, I think, a big role in this whole conversation about inequality in science. I think this is something that is noticed, especially when the, at least in this study, when they mention that Latino people, both men and women, are more likely to say that there is stereotyping issue these people are often as Sonia was saying before going to be stereotyped and disadvantaged more than white women in academia so it also makes sense that this collective this group would highlight this issue higher than white people did so i, I think this study for me was very interesting because of the target group undergrads of course this was focused in the us it could be different in europe but overall we do see similar behaviors and just want to say thank you for the for the amazing award you just gave us they are very nice thank you very much and thank you to everybody who's been giving us awards so far and thank you very much for this nice big award you just gave us there so um yeah, I think that was an interesting study to highlight. And when preparing for, for uh, this conversation today, we found a lot of studies. Studies on women not getting hired as much as men. Studies on women still facing bias at the peer review level. Studies of women still facing bias at the level of teaching evaluations, which then plays into which funding agencies we can apply for. Um, there's a lot, a lot of problems. So these are across all the spectrum, as Sonia mentioned, everything from microaggressions to overt sexism, and of course, racism and effort, all the other bad isms that science is plagued with. But despite that, there are some solutions, there are some possible ways for it. So we're not just going to paint a completely bleak picture, there are some proposals on how we can address this. Now, interestingly, if you do a, a Google search for how to address the, the gender gap in STEM, the first 10 results you'll find are telling women how to be more pushy, telling women how to go after promotions. And it's uh, very, very hard to actually find studies that don't call on women to do all of the work. Yeah, I think um, it's also, I, I think it's also interesting because some of the, the results focus more on how to encourage more women to join science so so there are things like oh we should talk to you high school students and you know try to uh, make sure that the, the girls who are interested in physics actually end up doing physics for instance um but i think uh and, and this is something that i took from a talk by uh jess wade a couple of years ago so she's um uh, if you're on twitter you probably know her so she does a lot of wikipedia entries for notable women in science uh, but in, in her talk, she said that uh, we should instead be focusing more on how to retain the women that we already have, because the problem that we, we have is not that that girls are not interested in science. The problem is that the people who the, the, the women who are interested in science end up dropping out because of one of however many reasons. And so I think uh, I think when you talk about solutions, we should talk about uh, how to make our academic spaces more inclusive for one. So. Uh, we should have, for example, institutional support systems that uh, make sure that uh, if a woman is being harassed or being discriminated against, there's an avenue for her to reach out and kind of, you know, solve that problem. Uh, we could also look into more, and, and a lot of people have been pushing for this, uh, more affirmative action-based uh, solutions. So, for example, have some sort of quotas for the women that we hire. So I think all of, all of these kind of solutions end up, uh, or not end up, but like you can sort of summarize them by saying uh, you just create more opportunities for women. And people get a bit um, perturbed uh, when you say this, but especially when you mention quota, everyone just loses their mind because yes. they feel like you're taking away places from someone else, which is just not the case. It's 
it's like um, you're not taking away a place from anyone. You're just giving people who have been historically marginalized a seat at the table. And um, so yeah, so 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 things like th things like these are kind of what I have in mind when I think about solutions. And yeah, I, th I think something else that is very important is that we do need to change the whole gender roles, gender stereotypes, and this is not something that women can do alone. You know, if you if you see your female colleagues experiencing things like this, it shouldn't be left up to us to stand up. If you see something like this, you should stand up, you should support the women. And I think one important, important thing here that men in general can do as allies is to listen. And if a woman says this is a problem, the response is not, I don't think it's a problem. The response is, okay, let me, let me listen here and let me find out why this is a problem. Why am I being called out for this behavior? Why should I pay attention to this issue? And I think that's something that will take a while, but I do think there's a gradual shift here, especially among the younger faculty. I do think there was a shift here. I think it's getting better than it was. Maybe it's just because I've moved to different universities, but in general, I think it's getting better now than when I started my bachelor years ago in Spain overall. But there, there is still a lot that can be done. Of course, quotas is a very important part of it. Challenging gender roles, gender binaries, gender stereotypes is also a very important part of it. And it's often emphasized uh, the role models themselves. And I think this is also important because growing up, there was probably one or two female scientists I saw on TV against all of the male ones. And then it's very, very hard to see this as something that I could do when people are constantly telling me women are bad at science, women are bad at mathematics. Are you sure you're in the right place? You're at a physics table. Perhaps you want to go to the biology department. When you hear all of these things and then you look around in science and you don't find the role models or people who are there, it makes it very, very difficult to see yourself in that position. And of course, you can still do it anyway. We still do it anyway. We still want to be here. But this level of inviting people to the conversation and making sure that the voices are heard, I think, is extremely important. And this can be done in, in also very simple ways. Anybody teaching a course can make sure that when they're mentioning historical people, they're not only mentioning historical white men that contributed to the field. We often talk about the women who were overlooked in science, and there's so many of them. A couple of years ago, I was preparing a list of women in science specifically for, for this International Women's Day a few years ago. And almost half of them, I was writing comments like, how many of our colleagues got the Nobel Prize? She was overlooked. And these are names that I'd never heard of until I looked into them. And I think this is something that we can also really, really change is how much visibility we give to women who have contributed to the field and who are contributing to the field today. Yeah, it's it's. A thing right like you uh, you highlight the women that you know that who are doing great science but you also highlight uh, the women who were there before you and yep, yeah I think exactly. I think it's, it's something that everyone can do at every level oh, on that note throughout the periscope uh, sorry throughout the broadcast here old habits you might see banners appearing on the screen where we're highlighting women in science who have made important contributions if you don't know the names that are appearing, I really encourage you to research them afterwards because they're all extremely interesting women who contributed a lot to science. So if you see any name up here on the screen that you're not familiar with, do feel inclined to check them out and figure out what they've done and why they're important for the field. So, so I see there's, there's a comment there that dismissal by male colleagues is a very real plague in academia that needs to be addressed. Absolutely it is. And I think something else that also in the term of microaggression personally bothers me a lot is men interrupting women in meetings, speaking over us, especially with Zoom meetings. This is becoming very easy for people to just, oh, I didn't realize you were talking and talk over you. And it is something that seems to happen a lot more often to women than men. And then there's the other side of that. If you propose an idea and five minutes later, your male colleague proposes exactly the same idea and takes credit for it. These are behaviors that we witness probably on a weekly basis. And this is something that we really need to call out. And this is a place where people really can do better. Um, there are people across all levels now that, that stand up for this. I have witnessed professors cut people off and say, I was talking to her, you know, let her finish. And that is good. It's nice when people do this and stand up for us and help out so that we're not the ones with the burden all the time. <coughs> I think also with, with whenever you have a differential in authority, then it becomes harder to speak up. So it's very nice when people 
who are maybe more senior to you uh, at the same table would, would say, uh, okay, this is not right. So someone else was talking, let them finish, which I also have seen. And it's, it's, it's pretty good uh, when it happens. Yeah, yeah, it's always nice when, when people in more senior positions have your back and help out. Mm -hmm. So as I said at the beginning of the broadcast, we are happy to also discuss our research, what we do, what we work on. You know, we don't just want this to be a conversation about the problems women face in science. It should also be a celebration of women in science. So feel free to ask any questions you have, both about what we've already discussed and about our research and, you know, about science in general. So maybe to get things started going in this direction, Sania, do you want to explain your research in more than the 30 seconds you did at the beginning? Yeah, sure. Um, so like I said, uh, my research kind of sits between particle physics and cosmology. So I get the best of both worlds in some sense. Um, I get to study the universe, but I also get to study the universe at a very tiny, tiny scale. So um, mostly what I focused on essentially is uh, the particle nature of dark matter. So we know that so dark matter is this mysterious thing that makes up about 80% of our universe. Um, we know it's there because we see its effects in uh, what, we, what we see when you look at the night sky. So um, for the regulars, for Diana's haps, is it haps? Haps, uh, yes. Yes, okay, for the regulars, for Diana's haps, uh, they would know what dark matter is. So it's kind of, um, and why we know it's there. So one of the ways that you can, uh, that we know that dark matter is out there is when we look at uh, galaxies far away. And uh, what we measure when you look at galaxies far away is the velocity of the stars that are rotating at the outer edge uh, of the galaxies. And so if you only have visible matter, what you would expect is that the farther you go out from the core of your galaxy, these stars would rotate slow, more slow, slower. Yeah. And um, what, what we actually see when we observe these galaxies, uh, the farther that you go out, the velocities either saturate or in some cases slightly increase which means that there is more mass in that galaxy than what we are seeing in the form of stars. And so this is one of the evidences that we have of kind of this mysterious dark component of the universe, which doesn't interact with anything that we know of, but it's still there. And as physicists, we want to know what it is made out of. And so for me, it's uh, coming at it from a particle physics perspective. So I look at viable particles that can make up this dark thing. And then I study kind of how these particles would shape the universe in some sense, but also how we can detect them today with uh, various kinds of detectors on the surface of the Earth and also, uh, you know, in space, etc. So, so before we jump in with how to detect dark matter or the follow up, just want to say how complementary the research we do is because I focus much more on the cosmological side. But I asked the question of what can we learn about dark matter from the universe itself? So rather from go rather than going from more of a bottom-up approach of here's a model, now it's tested, I get the observations and then say, okay, now with these observations, what can we learn about dark matter? And you really do need the interplay of both because there's only so far you can get with cosmology, you can get general bounds, like it's a species, it's dark, we know there's this amount of it. But when you really want to get down to the nitty gritty of what is dark matter made of, how does dark matter interact? This is where we need particle physics. And this is where people like Sania give me fun models to work on. Yeah, and it's, 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 uh, it's kind of nice. I think that's the thing about dark matter is that you can, uh, because we know so little about it, you can think of many different ways of, of how to get kind of what you see. So like Diana says, she, she can tell you like, uh, like a band of basically parameter space that, that is valid. So she can tell you, so if dark matter is a species like this, these are some general behaviors that it would have. And then I come in and I would tell her that, okay, so this is kind of like a particle model that we can study. And so this reproduces kind of the features that you see, but also then from this particle model, I can, I can kind of test it at detectors. So this would be more kind of particle specific. And so I think, I think with particle physics, at least for me, um, the idea is to kind of, use a model to make as model independent a claim as possible, just because there's so many models out there. So what you want to do is kind of find out generic features of the model that you have, uh, so that even if kind of dark matter is not that model, you can still say something about, you know, another related model maybe. Yeah, I, I think on, on that point, we can make an interesting, perhaps historical comment here that currently our most well motivated and accepted model of dark matter is the idea of cold dark matter. So dark matter that moves rather slowly, it doesn't really interact with other things. 
And from a historical perspective, one of the first people to propose this idea of cold dark matter was actually a woman. Um, that would be, let me just get her name correct, that would be Professor Sarah Faber, who was actually one of the first to show that dark matter could not be made up of neutrinos. Now, neutrinos are these tiny, tiny particles that travel almost at the speed of light, and they have the cool feature that they don't interact with the electromagnetic force, which makes them sound very much like dark matter. We can't see them, you know, they, they don't really do much, they're just zipping through the universe constantly. Could they be dark matter? And they actually can't be, and we know this by looking at galaxies and like the weight of galaxies, the distribution of galaxies, we can actually put constraints on how warm dark matter can be. And this led to the standard accepted idea of dark matter, which is cold dark matter, which is our current idea now. So then from cosmology, I can say dark matter is cold, but then what does that mean? This is where we need particle physics. Mm -hmm. and, and from kind of like from a physics side then, as Diana said, neutrinos cannot be dark matter because they're very light, which means that they travel very fast. And one of the things that would happen if you have a very, very fast moving particle in the early universe is that the clustering that you would otherwise have would not happen. So what happens is basically uh, so structure forms in the universe because of dark matter, essentially. So you can think about it as like this very heavy thing that kind of sits and attracts everything around it gravitationally. And then this actually forms structure. But then if instead of this very heavy uh, thing, you have very light, fast moving particles, you won't be able to form these structures because they would just kind of zip about. And uh, so one of the main ideas that that, that uh, people look at or one of the main paradigms for dark matter is then something called the WIMP or the weakly interacting massive particle, which just means that you have a massive particle. So it's big, it's not a neutrino and it's very weakly interacting. So it doesn't it doesn't talk to light or to other other particles uh, very strongly. So it's uh, yeah, and so, so this is the paradigm that has been kind of looked at for many, many years. But then one of the problems with WIMPs is that, uh, well, um, well, yeah, so, so one of the problems, this is plot that Tiana has just put up, which basically um, tells you, uh, okay, so I'm, I'm thinking about a simpler way to explain this plot. So basically <laughs> uh, the left, uh, the X, or the Y axis of the plot tells you how strongly dark matter would interact uh, with normal matter, so things like your coffee cup or your table, etc. And then the the, the x-axis is uh, the mass, so how heavy it is. And the lines you can understand, so everything above the line is excluded, meaning that if dark matter interacted that strongly, we would have seen it in our detectors. So what we do with our detectors is that we basically take a giant watt of, uh, of uh, materials, for example, liquid xenon, and we place it underground. And then we just sit and wait. Um, because we have a local kind of dark matter density. So we have dark matter particles that are just streaming across Earth every, every moment. And so what we do is we wait for one of these particles to hit the xenon, and then the xenon kind of re rebounds, and then this gives us a signal. And we can, and we can uh, kind of remove all of the background and say, OK, this is, uh, this is from a dark matter particle hitting the xenon. And so what these lines basically tell you is we have seen no such events. So we haven't seen kind of this rebound yet which means that dark matter has to interact weakly, then, then these signs show. And this is kind of one of the, uh, one of the problems with WIMPs is that if, if you want to have an interaction which is weak scale, which is physics terms, physics term for like kind of a standard scale in physics, um, you would expect to see them at xenon, but we don't, which means it's, it's either the case that uh, it's not, the dark matter is not a WIMP or it's, kind of behaving in a more funny way than kind of a generic WIMP model would have you believe. So I just want to add a, a comment there onto that very nice explanation, just so we're all clear. We said before that dark matter doesn't interact via the electromagnetic force and it mainly only interacts gravitationally. However, here we're not talking about gravitational interactions, we're talking about weak interactions. So there are four forces that govern everything in the universe. The electromagnetic force, which we're used to, electricity, magnetism, the strong force, which holds everything together inside atoms. The weak force, which is responsible for radioactive decay and a lot of other fun phenomena that we never go into detail about. And the gravitational force, which makes things drop or objects with mass attract each other. So here we're talking about dark matter having weak interactions. So the WIMP idea is a weakly interacting massive particle because we're really good at naming things. Then if you go lower than WIMP and you have a feebly interacting dark matter particle, you call it a FIMP because we're really good at naming things. So I, I see a question in the chat. Yeah, that's um, a very nice question from Abyss. 
Uh, yes, so uh, so the question is, uh, what are the experimental methods that can prove if dark matter is in fact a supersymmetric counterpart to the standard model particle? Um, so this is this is a very good question. I think uh, the answer to this question is, if we detect something, or when we actually detect something, uh, there would be a number of ways to kind of explain that signature. And then, so, so what kind of, uh, the thing with supersymmetry is that you can build a model. So WIMPs were initially supersymmetric uh, particles as well. So the idea of WIMPs is based in supersymmetry itself. Uh, but then we, we didn't see kind of any evidence for supersymmetry at uh, CERN, for example. So at the LHC, which is like a collider, uh, which means that either those particles are, are heavier than we expected. So they're, they're at like a larger scale or they're not there. So, so we're still pushing the limits. So, so there's not one experimental method that you can think of that would conclusively prove or disprove supersymmetry because you can always kind of tune your model in a way to either evade constraints or you know, make a prediction which is at a higher scale than, than our current sensitivities. Yeah, I, I want to, to mention here and bring it back to what we said before. You mentioned before there's a lot of dark matter models. And part of the reason there are so many possible dark matter models is that we don't have direct observations of dark matter. And there's a lot of models you can dream up of that fit the data that we do have. And while we're, we haven't yet figured out what dark matter is, we're very good at rolling out these models. So you can take a model from the constantly growing stack of dark matter models, you can do specific tests, and you might be able to roll out that model. Model might predict, OK, if dark matter interacts in this exact way, we would see it at this experiment. We haven't seen it, therefore we roll out this dark matter model. But then there's still thousands of other dark matter models you can go through. Ideally, you like finding results or experiments that can roll out several of these models simultaneously. And this also ties back to what Sunny was saying before, of trying to make model independent claims, which are then applicable to a broad class of models, so that you can remove a whole, a whole bunch from the stack instead of bit by bit chipping away at the mountain. So this is one problem that we face with dark matter studies is that we're, we're very good at figuring out what dark matter isn't, but it's really difficult to figure out what dark matter is because there's an infinite amount of ways you can change your dark matter model. There's many, many possible ways dark matter could be hiding from us. So we're just doing the best we can to constrain as many models as we can, but there will always be alternative models. And it's very similar with, super, with Susie here, supersymmetric counterpart to the standard model. We haven't found observation yet, but you can't really, really rule it out because you can just change the model parameters and then it might still be viable. Yeah. I, I think this is also, you can think about, you can take this in either way. So you can either be completely daunted and overwhelmed by all of these models and, and just give up because we don't have a signal, so like a clear signal. So we don't know where to fit these models, but then you can also think about it in a, in a way uh, in that you're just we're really just bound by our creativity in this sense uh, so so it's 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 interesting if you think about it that way because you can just basically uh, you, you know kind of th this is kind of one of those things where you're doing science but you can actually be very creative in how you do science or how you approach uh, so what kind of models are interesting so that is one question then what kind of experiments can you dream up uh, that would probe like different parts of the parameter space, which is not probed yet. Uh, so there's a lot of room for improvement and for development in, in dark matter, which is pretty amazing. Yeah, and I think the creativity part is also very important because we do love what we do. And, and part of the reason is that, you know, we're poking at the universe and trying to figure out what's happening there. But we also really do get to dream up random models and then see if we can actually probe these anyway. And um, there's a, a project I worked on last year that I really enjoyed specifically for this reason. So we were looking at the idea of if you have primordial black holes in the early universe, which are a type of black hole that is formed before the first star, so really early primordial black holes. These primordial black holes could evaporate via Hawking radiation. And then we asked the question of what if this evaporation produces dark matter? So this is like a really random model, like, OK, you're assuming primordial black holes, you're assuming that it produces the dark matter, and then we assume that it produces all of the dark matter we see today. And the very, very nice thing is that you can actually constrain this model by looking at the light you're getting from different, different distant galaxies. You can use structure formation data, so the amount of structure you have, the size of galaxies, and something known as Lyman alpha forests, which just tell you how much hydrogen is between different galaxies. And you can actually use these things to constrain 
how much of the primordial black holes could have produced this dark matter. So we could actually rule out a lot of parameter space. This model is so viable, but we could exclude a lot of possibilities. And this is just one of those like random models that is not within the standard paradigm, but it's a crazy idea. And you can actually study this crazy idea and find hints for it from cosmology. And I think that's really, really fun to do. So like look at models that perhaps are a bit weird and, and try to figure out what to do with them. Yeah, I, I think it's it's the fun part of the job, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's much but, more fun than what we do often of debugging codes that aren't running or writing new yeah. codes that aren't running. When you actually get to play about with models like this, when your code works, it's much nicer. Uh, I was going to say that it's, it's much better than looking for factors of two for like weeks. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there's always a factor of two missing in your equations or a factor of four or a factor of one half, you know, and you can spend months on that. But it is rewarding. It, it is nice when you get it done. That just reminds me, there was a question quite early on in, in the broadcast that we didn't answer. Let's see if I can just see it again. What advice would you give young ladies starting out in the field? What do you think, Sania? Um, I don't know. I think the advice I would give was uh, would be to just stick with it. Because uh, it, it's, it's very sad that we're still in a place where uh, we have to sort of, there is the general handbook of how you do physics and there's like a women's advice handbook of how you do physics because you have to warn people, not warn people, but you have to basically inform people who are coming in about the possible problems that they might face and kind of how to, uh, you know, uh, figure out a way out of those problems. So my advice would be, well, I, I think I would first say that I'm sorry <laughs> that I have to give you specific advice uh, still, uh, but then, you know, just stick with it and find basically your people in whatever community. So uh, usually um, because we still have this discrimination uh, of this, this gender gap in STEM fields, it's uh, usually it ends up that you're the only woman in your group, uh, which is a bit sad, but I think it's important to find community so if not in your immediate group, then maybe in your department, maybe people, um, you know, who uh, in surrounding departments. So, so just find a community that you can talk to about your problems. And uh, I, think, I think for the physics part, it's going to work out. So you can do amazing science. It's, it's going to be fine from the physics part. Don't, don't feel threatened by, you know, other people being smarter than you, but uh, have a community that, that, you know, would stand by you if you face problems. Yeah, I think that's extremely important advice and also not to be daunted by it. I mean, we talk about all the problems in science and they are there, but it is also very rewarding. You need to be passionate to be in science. You need to be curious and otherwise you just stick with it. And some, something that I was told once that I think is very amusing and a good life philosophy sometimes is that pettiness is a perfectly good reason to succeed. And if you want to succeed and become a famous physicist just to prove all the men who told you you couldn't do it wrong, that is a very valid reason to succeed as a physicist, just to tell them, ha ha, look, look where I am, you told me I wouldn't be here, ha ha. That is a very, very good motivator sometimes. So obviously it would be nice if we didn't have to deal with this, but don't let it bring you down because there are women who make it and we are gradually changing the field for better. And, and also just uh, just to reiterate what Diana said, there are also very awesome people in physics. Uh, there are yeah. awesome men and uh, you know it's uh, it could be that you never face any of these problems that you just end up uh, with a very supportive group. I think my group in Aachen is very good. Um, so so don't be uh, yeah don't be intimidated by all of these stories because there, there still are uh, good people. Yeah, and, and one thing you can do, which we shouldn't have to give this advice, but it's you still, if you're in the position of choosing where to do your PhD, where to do your postdoc, it's very useful to speak to the more junior people already at the department, especially if you can find like a woman already at the department, email them and ask them the direct questions, because if there is a problem, you will likely be warned about it or you'll notice some red flags. And often you'll get messages back like, oh, they're super supportive, this person is amazing. You know, you can already see from the tone where it's going. And I think it's very important to, to ask people for advice. And people who've been in the groups know it better than others. So it's always a good place to start and not to ignore advice you're given from people already in the department. 
but yeah, as Sonia said, it's quite sad that we need this like separate guide for navigating science. And to bring it back to what we said at the beginning, there's also a separate guide for navigating science as a different minority. If you're a woman of color, if you're disabled, if you're trans, any of these play a role as well. So there's the guidebook for women. I can only speak of white women in academia, but of course, every minority in the overlap will have different guidebooks for dealing with science. And this is why I think it's very important, as Sunia said, to find a network, to find people who are like you, who will help you, who, who can help you navigate the system. Yeah, and, and I think, uh, so at least for me personally, I'm very happy to answer emails uh, from people. And it's, it's, and I have done this as well. So I have reached out to people uh, at other places, asking them very straightforwardly about, you know, what the climate is uh, at the department. And usually people are very, uh, very nice and upfront uh, about it. So yeah, don't, uh, don't be scared of writing an email, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's nothing to lose with right? reaching out to people and just asking, you know, how are you doing? It's there. What's a group like? It's it's an easy thing, or not easy, because writing emails is always scary, but it's something that that could help a lot. Yeah. So I see there is another dark matter question, quite a long question. It's nice that Haps doesn't have a character limit on the questions. You can write ridiculously long questions now. If you have to place a bet, do you think direct evidence of dark matter is likely to be discovered through observations of distant galaxies, or particle colliders, orders of magnitude better than the LHC? What do you think? I'm not. I'm not sure. So I think the problem um, with distant galaxies would be background, I guess. Yeah. Um, and I think then it would also be the question of does that really count as direct evidence? Because once again, you'd just be seeing the gravitational effects of dark matter, whereas uh, in a collider is where you really get the direct evidence. Yeah, but I uh, but I was thinking more like indirect detection, so like the gamma ray excess. Yeah, yeah, of course. So 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 for example, we we have a current excess that we can't explain. So uh, uh, what what I mean when I say excess is that we look at a piece of the sky and we see that there are more photons coming from that part of the sky than we expected, uh, which qualifies it as an excess, but uh, we don't know why that is. So it could be that it's just some standard model process that we haven't, uh, you know, accounted for in our simulations. Um, uh, but it could also be that it's dark matter annihilating. So I think with, uh, with distant galaxies, it would probably be the same. So I'm not sure if it would be very easy to kind of separate the, the dark matter signal from background. But then I'm also not sure if this would be the case for a larger particle collider. Um, but I think yeah. I would I, I would lean towards the particle collider just because it's it's, it's cool. Yeah, it's always a question of can we just build much more much bigger experiments and much bigger detectors where we find something, or do we need different type of detectors? And I think it's likely we will find something in direct searches. I think direct searches are more likely than indirect searches, as Sunny said, just because of the huge amount of backgrounds. But I also think we might find hints of the nature of dark matter from cosmology. What I worked on a lot during my PhD was proposing new models of dark matter that we might be able to test and then looking for hints of these. And sometimes you come up with specific models, like for an example, dark matter interacting with photons. So we know that this usually doesn't happen. But maybe in the early universe, there was a small interaction between particles of light and dark matter. If this happens, it makes a specific signal in the CMB temperature anisotropies and also in the overall black body spectrum of the CMB. And this is a clear signal. Like if you measure the signal, it's likely that this model is more correct than we thought because it's a prediction of this model. So there's also a lot of ways you can go about doing this. The, the problem, well, not really problem, but nice thing and problem is that currently all of our data seem to point to just cold dark matter, no interactions, nothing really exotic happening, from which point we then definitely need to go to particle physics to find our answers. Yeah, so, so the follow up to that is uh, <coughs> Abyss was actually referring to dark matter annihilation as direct evidence. So this is actually, yeah, so, so this would be something like a gamma ray excess. Um, yeah, but then this, this, yeah, like I said, it would have run into the problem of separating a foreground from background. Yeah, I think it would be very nice if we could see something at direct detection at terrestrial experiments. So, so this thing where we basically wait for dark matter to knock off something from our target. Um, 
I, I think that would be pretty amazing if we have like a clear signal there because uh, yeah, I, I, th I think I'm just biased towards direct detection. But it is harder to argue with. You don't have as many systematics. You don't have as much background noise. A signal there, obviously, there would be a lot of questions about it. But if a signal there is confirmed that more than five sigma, then it's very hard to argue with it. And it would really constitute direct evidence for dark matter. Yeah. And I think one, one of the fun things that you can do with these experiments is so because you have like the Earth that is rotating, uh, so, so the position of your detector is changing daily. So if you have enough of these signals, uh, you would find that the, the number of events that you have would differ between uh, morning and night. So, so if you imagine like a dark matter flux that is hitting, so sometimes the detector is right on this edge of the Earth. And so uh, you have kind of uh, more events. But then if it's on the opposite end, you have dark matter passing through the entirety of the Earth to get to the detector. So you might have fewer events. And so you can actually get like a modulation in your signal, which which you wouldn't get from any of the commonly studied backgrounds. So this could be a very interesting way to kind of uh, disentangle what you're seeing to be actually from dark matter than from, uh, you know, something like a train passing overhead or something. Yeah, it would definitely be perhaps easier to, to see in, or easier to claim a detection in a direct detection, or in a collider search or direct detection experiments. I think direct detection experiments more so than colliders. <coughs> Doing a broadcast after a day of work, my voice is breaking. Yeah, that makes the two of us. <laughs> so uh, perhaps one last question to finish on, because we're nearly at the hour mark. There was a question there of who were your mentors or role models when you were younger? So I think I'm going to give like a very, um, uh, yeah, I think it's a very cliched answer. Um, at least when I was growing up, uh, I, I'm, I've been very fortunate that I have a family that is extremely supportive. So I, I never felt um, the need to have a role model per se, because I, I never kind of uh, I, I never thought that I was not allowed to do something just because I, I was a woman. And then this is uh, this is something that is also it, it's striking because I come uh, from a country where gender bias and gender discrimination is still very prevalent. Um, so this is a completely, so this is a, a form of privilege on my part as well, that I just had a very supportive family. And so most of my role models are people from my family. So like my mother, my father, my grandparents. Yeah, yeah I think it, it's something that can be underestimated because my first answer there would also be my family. And I was always encouraged from a young age to do whatever I want. And there was no glass ceiling that I couldn't break through. And that really, really does help. So I think this is also something we can say to any any parents out there, you know, if you have a, a young girl who wants to go to science, absolutely encourage them because it does make a huge difference. And it's something that we all remember very well. <coughs> and on a slightly less serious note, just to throw out another role model, not really role model, but somebody who I was always amazed by was actually a fictional character, one of the few female astrophysicists in fiction, which is Samantha Carter from Stargate. She was like amazing woman, super cool, could build a wormhole. Very, very nice. It's like, wait, maybe I could maybe I could build a wormhole. You know, she, she figured it out. So that's definitely a less serious answer, but it is somebody in fiction at least who I noticed a lot. It's like that that's kind of cool. It's it's very important to have these representations in fiction. Definitely. Yeah, I, I think that is something that is increasing a lot more, especially what I've seen is an increase of fiction aimed at kids that feature women scientists, like the um, Ada Lace books, which are really amazing. It's the story of a fun physicist. So there are a lot more role models in, in science fiction and a lot more role models. I think being in the age of social media, I've been able to connect and meet with a lot of amazing women in science who I didn't know about otherwise and who are very inspiring role models. So I think that is also very important currently. <coughs> so given that we're both like completely out of voice, I think we should end the, end the broadcast here. So thank you to everybody for the nice questions and comments and for the nice awards. And of course, thank you, Sonia, for agreeing to join today. It was great to have you on, on HAPS with me. Thank you for having me. It was, it was very fun. Yeah, ho hopefully I'll convince you in the future to join for another time as well. Yes, hopefully.
I, I always ask that on camera, as you know, that it's more of an obligation. So uh, to my regulars, I know I've got into a regular broadcast on Sundays. I'm not sure if I'll do a broadcast on Sunday because that is only like three days away. I would let you know at least 24 hours in advance. Look out for an upcoming broadcast for the next time I do a broadcast. And in the meantime, I hope everybody stays safe and, you know, go read up on women in science today. Go celebrate the women in science and just go celebrate all the women you know. And remember to, to be aware of how intersectionality plays a huge role in this conversation. Okay, any last last comments from Sunia? Um, yes, uh, I, I guess just make space for women to speak, listen to them, uh, hire them, cite them. Uh, yeah, and educate yourself. <laughs> yeah, include us in the conversation and listen to us. Yes. Okay, so thank you everybody. I hope to see you soon and I hope everybody stays safe. Yep. Bye.